Phil Hepler. All right. Welcome to Music Off the Record. Um, I am Dr. Ken Owen. We're here talking about the music that's going to be on the next Northwest Symphonietta concert, learning a little bit about Ravel and Strauss. Our concert is May 13th, 14th, and 15th, uh, 15th here in Puyallup with Eric Jacobson coming back. It's his third concert, I believe, and so excited to have him come back and, and work with the orchestra again. So here's our composers, Ravel and Strauss. Does everyone know which one's which? I mean, I guess it's obvious in order, right? Ravel's the one up there on top. So we're going to do here two pieces by Ravel, the Mother Goose Suite and the Piano Concerto in G, and then uh, one by Strauss. And my French is admittedly poor, so I'm not even going to try to say the French. We're just going to point to the screen and let you say it on your own. <laughs> All right, so Ravel, first of all, born in March, uh, right near the Spanish border, just so that you can figure out where that town is, put the little map up there. So that, that area near the Spanish-French, kind of right on that border, is sometimes referred to as Basque, and the people there, they're kind of a mix called Basque. Uh, and his mother was Basque and proud of her Basque heritage. She spoke Spanish. Um, and she made sure to teach Ravel about some of that heritage and things like that. His father was actually from Switzerland. S uh, Stravinsky once referred to Ravel as the finest sw Swiss watchmaker. <laughs> he was referring in part to the whole um, um, kind of precision of Ravel's composition, but the Swiss end of it was partly because Stravinsky knew that his father was Swiss, so kind of a little bit uh, of that in there. Um, oops, I made that go away. Here it comes back. So uh, young Ravel was very talented. His parents saw that, and so right away they tried to provide every opportunity to make sure that he would get the education that he needed. So part of that is at 14 years old, they head into Paris, and he begins to study at the conservatory. Now, 14 is quite young to be at the conservatory. This is university-level music study, and he's 14 years old. Um, not as a composition major at this point, he's doing piano. Um, and uh, actually, as a young pianist, he's good enough to get in that young, but he's not, after his career there, after a few years, he's not really ever considered their star piano student. He's not um, the best, not that he's bad, he's just not their greatest performer. What he's more known for is this, the, the faculty appreciate his real eagerness to learn and his eagerness to seek out new experiences. You know, he's not afraid of new music or performing things that are maybe unconventional, uh, as well as just any, anything else that he can get his hands on. So 20 years old, he graduates. Um, when a couple years later, he comes back now to study composition and um, doesn't get along too well with the faculty. Um, a lot of the curriculum uh, includes studying and composing in old forms. So you've got to write fugues like Bach and you've got to write sonata forms. And, and uh, they kind of looked down on him and said that he was not very good at these old forms. They did not like him. Uh, in fact, when he uh, applied for graduate, further graduate study, they, 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 they rejected him and said no. Uh, but thank goodness he did have uh, one faculty who recognized his genius and really nurtured him, and that was Faure, if you're familiar with the composer Gabriel Faure. So Faure, Faure was his teacher and really championed Ravel and kind of helped fight. Uh, there's uh, Faure. So he kind of went against those other uh, mustached old guys, remarkably similar. One of the Muppets there in Foray, don't you think? <laughs> and, and Foray managed to win out, and so Ravel studied there with Foray and did quite well. One of the things that they would do at the conservatory there in France was a composition competition. Try saying that five times fast. Composition competition. <laughs> Called the Prix de Rome. Now this had been around for quite a while by the time Ravel was there. Uh, Berlioz, a composer, won it. Uh, originally, it was the winner would get a all expenses paid couple of years to spend in Rome. Um, when it started, Rome was more of a musical center than Paris was, and you'd go and study opera and things. And then by the time Ravel's around, I'm not sure if that was the same prize because Paris was more of a musical center than Rome was at this point. But anyway, it's still a very prestigious thing and, and you know big thing to win. So he enters the Prix de Rome five times. Now. Times one through four, he did not win. Although I do have to say, once he won kind of a second, second place. But he always felt a little bit like the, the ball there with the L. He felt like he was late, and he never could win this thing. So if you feel like you never win, you're in good company. Ravel never did win this stinking uh, composition competition. The best he got was there was kind of a premier winner first place and a premier category second place, and then a secondary first place and secondary. I don't know why they did it that way, but they did. So it kind of was a second place of the second rung, if that makes any sense. That's the best he ever got. Well, 
In the meantime, Ravel is actually becoming known and having quite a bit of success as a composer, uh, not even just around France, but uh, internationally. He's, he's getting to be really known. And by his fifth try, he is quite a renowned composer internationally. And once again, he enters and loses. In fact, he's kicked out right at the beginning, the first round, on one of these old forms that those faculty said he was always weak in. Uh, it was a fugue and a choral piece. Um, so this Bach-like stuff, and he, it, he didn't do well enough for them, and they kicked him out. Well, at this point, um, we had riots. <laughs> this isn't actually a picture of the riot or anything, but we did have an outrage. We had people writing in, complaining people of, um, you know, sway with uh, people at the conservatory and things that were absolutely upset uh, and writing things. And so the result was that uh, Fidar Dubois, who was the director of the conservatory, had to step down. So in other words, somebody lost their job over the fact that Ravel did not win that fifth time when the now internationally famous composer enters again the student composition competition and loses. <laughs> so um, that was a, a big deal. Director loses his job, and guess who takes this place? For a Ravel's very own teacher. So uh, that works out well for Ravel, although he didn't enter a sixth time. I don't know if there was a limit or what. But um, So as to move on, as we get to start talking about Mother Goose, Ravel said that he loved children. Now, whenever people rave about how much they love children, you always have to ask that question. <laughs> Do they have any children? <laughs> he said he loved children. He never had children. Coincidence that he never had children, that he loved children? <laughs> I am joking. I, of course, myself have five children. Whoops. There they are. And I love them so much I just about can't stand it. So there's my five. So you can have children and love them. I am joking, of course. Prevel did not have any, though. But he was asked by some friends uh, to watch their children while they went out of town for a week or so. And uh, they had two kids, a boy and a girl, Mimi and Jean. Uh, they were, I'm not sure what, I know one of them was nine or ten-ish. So, you know, they're around that age. Uh, these kids, he, uh, he would tell them stories. Mimi, the daughter, uh, wrote this, that uh, he used to tell me stories uh, that I loved. He used to climb on his knee and he would begin once upon a time and off he would go into one of these familiar fairy tales. Um, and uh, she just talks uh, extensively in her writings about the, the connection that their family had. Ravel was a close friend of this family and she, she says things like, I, I don't have any memories without Ravel in them. You know, he was an important part of their family. So he wanted, he came with this idea. He was actually teaching these kids piano lessons. And he thought, well, I'll write a piece for these two kids, a little duet to play. Um, <laughs> this is Mimi's thoughts on that idea. Neither my brother nor I was of an age to appreciate such a dedication, and we regarded it rather as something entailing hard work. <laughs> the kids didn't think this was such a cool idea. Uh, in fact, not only did he want to write it for them, but he wanted them to premiere it in a grand performance. Mimi said, the idea filled me with a cold terror. <laughs> so maybe a face, something like that, I don't know. <laughs> the kids didn't like the idea so much, but that was originally the conception of the piece. And so the orchestra piece that we'll hear was originally a piano duet for these two children. And because of that, it was a little easier. It's, I mean, Ravel writes some beastly difficult, I um, mean, wonderful, incredible, lovely piano music, but it can be very hard. Um, this is not. This is you know, written to be playable for children. It was challenging for these kids. They didn't think it was quite <laughs> simple enough for children, but that was the intent. Um, and it was based on these same stories that he loved to tell the children that they loved to listen to. And so, um, again, I'm not going to give a shot at the, at the French if anybody else wants to uh, go ahead and holler it out. But um, some favorite fairy tales, and they're listed there. Hop of My Thumb is not as familiar to us. It's kind of a mix of... Uh, Thumbelina and Hansel and Gretel, we'll talk about it in a minute. Um, the third one, if you try to look up the story, actually the story is something about to the effect of the green serpent, and he's kind of lifted a, a portion of it out and titled it The Ugly Little Girl, Empress of the Pagodas. So it's kind of part of another familiar fairy tale. Beauty and the Beast, of course, we know. The Fairy Garden isn't so much a tale as just kind of a landscape to summarize and wrap up the piece. So let's look at each of them. Uh, when he wrote these, it was in 1908. Actually, that's when he writes this first one, The Pavan of a Sleeping Beauty. Uh, the rest he wrote a couple of years later. Uh, that's when he wanted the children to premiere them. They were too scared. They did not premiere them. <laughs> they chickened out. And so a couple of other, uh, maybe a little older kids, premiered them. 
1911, the next year, he orchestrated it into a suite, and it actually even ended up turning into a ballet, uh, this, the Mother Goose. So that's where kind of the whole piece went. Pavan, that title, a pavan is a slow and stately dance dating back into the Renaissance. Think maybe the dance that the royalty would enter into. So kind of a processional, slow, um, sort of stately dance. Um, and Ravel does his typically uh, unique orchestration where you hear lots of wonderful colors. So we have that kind of slow, stately pavan. Beautiful stuff. Um, the next one, the hop of my thumb. So again, think of the boy version of Thumbelina. Uh, the, char the character named Hop of my thumb um, is the seventh child in a big family and very, very small. So there's kind of a you know, portrayal of it there with the little guy here. And not just that he's a toddler, he's just that small. But what he lacks in size, he makes up for in wit. And, and, you know, cleverness. Well, and then the, here's where the Hansel and Gretel story comes in. The, the story is that the parents are so destitute, times are so tough that they can't, they're all going to starve, and so they try to dump the kids in the woods. Uh, but, of course, it's the little guy, Hop on My Thumb, who figures out to use some stones as they, to track their, their chart, their course, as they head out into the woods, and so he finds their way back. Second time, he can't get the stones, so he uses breadcrumbs, just like Hansel and Gretel. The birds eat them. But instead of finding a candy house in a witch, they find an ogre who tries to eat them, and, and the little guy saves the day in the end. So very similar to the Hansel and Gretel story. Uh, so lots of colorful things to listen for. We do hear some clever sound effects that, that Ravel puts in here. And uh, he doesn't really tell us exactly what is meaning what, but you know, he can leave a little bit of that up to your imagination. striking sound effects of birds and things like that that we hear in, uh, in that movement. It's kind of fun. All right, so this story, The Ugly Little Girl, Empress of the Pagodas, is a, a, the basic story is that an evil fairy casts a spell on this Chinese princess, making her the ugliest girl. She's going to become the ugliest woman in the world. That's the curse the jealous evil fairy puts on her. Um, she, and running away, ends up finding some remote kingdom across the sea where she fall, falls in love with the emperor, although she's never actually seen him. That's the green serpent in the other story. We didn't worry about details, but basically just noted in the end, she falls in love, true love breaks the curse, and she becomes her beautiful natural self, uh, and of course becomes the empress. 
the pagodas being that place where she ends up being. So this being a Chinese princess, Ravel does uh, what's sometimes called exoticism in music. In other words, he, he uses things that to the French at the time sounded very oriental and exotic. It's nothing necessarily what Chinese music was really like, but to the French <laughs> at that time, that's what they thought it was like. So listen for some of those things. I can get it to go. Here we are. So one of the things is a pentatonic or a five-note scale. You can hear the unique scale that's kind of used. It doesn't sound typical major or minor, but these unique scales. That's that one. Next, Beauty and the Beast, of course, everybody knows this story. Um, his actual title is Beauty Converses with the Beast. Uh, he sets it up with a triple meter, very waltz sort of sounding. Uh, and then if you can listen, you hear this ominous sound where presumably the beast is entering. You hear this change in, uh, in color. Come on. quite descriptive music that Ravel gives us. All right, so we wrap it up with the fairy garden, again, more general, just kind of fantasy atmosphere. We'll play just a snippet of that one. beautiful fantasy land that, uh, that Ravel gives us. So that kind of wraps up our uh, Mother Goose Suite. So really fun music, uh, you know, some fun little stories to listen to music-wise. So our next piece is also by Ravel, Piano Concerto, quite a bit later. So remember that one, 1908 to 1910, uh, was the, this piece that we've been looking at. Piano Concerto, much closer to the end of his life, uh, completes it in 1931. 
Um, other things that have been happening in the meantime, not long before that, he was granted a, an honorary doctorate by Oxford. And while he's there in London for that trip, there he is with his robes on, getting his doctorate. Um, he's riding home on the train, and this is when he first gets this idea for writing this piano concerto. Um, although he puts it this way, I love this quote. He says, the G major concerto took two years of work, you know. The opening theme came to me on a train between Oxford and London, but the initial idea is nothing. The work of chiseling then began, <laughs> and it took him a couple of years, so 28 to 31, to really work this thing out. Um, so, you know, composers, sometimes we have, I, I heard this was a completely different composer, a, a Scandinavian composer that I heard at a convention recently, and he was talking about how he just bought a new house, and the neighbors found out he was a composer. They said, oh, leave your windows open, and we'll love to hear you. Like they think you just sit there and play beautiful music that you make up on the spot. <laughs> They're not going to like it. Bang, bang, no, I'll try this, no, bang, no, and I'll try this, no. You know, composing really is hard work. It's not just sitting down and spewing out beauty. It's not how it works. Unless you're Mozart, of course, but that's a different story. So uh, in 1928, uh, right before this degree is, um, this Oxford degree trip where he has the initial idea, He's on a big tour of the United States of America. He's here from January to April. Uh, so again, if we go back, that uh, doctorate was granted in 1928 when that ceremony is. So early, earlier in the same year, he's here in the US and he's doing performances both as a pianist, other performances as conductor. He's meeting with lots of notable people, of course, having a grand old time. One of the people that he meets is Gershwin. It's actually Gershwin that seeks out Ravel. Uh, Gershwin is seeking out Ravel as a teacher. Gershwin shows up and says, I want to study. Because you know, Gershwin's background is jazz and popular music, and he's starting to do classical composition. And he, so he wants to find a real legitimate composer to study with. So he comes to Ravel and shows him some music and says, will you be my teacher? Ravel looks over the music and says, this is fantastic. Just keep doing it. <laughs> and won't teach him because he says, I have nothing to teach you. Um, so between this meeting of Gershwin and other jazz that he heard, um, you know, it's, it's very likely that it's part of what jazz, uh, influenced the very jazziness of this piano concert. It has a very jazz sound to a lot of it, certainly the elements of jazz that are in there. Now, he'd been thinking about some of that and had heard some jazz before this, so it wasn't only this trip, but this trip that was right before the initial spark for this concerto certainly had an impact. Here's a picture of Ravel is the one sitting at the piano. Gershwin is on the far right. I'm not sure who the guy in the middle is, but there's Gershwin and Ravel at that meeting uh, that they did have. So this uh, concerto is very light and has a lot of jazz in it. And uh, Ravel's concept of a concerto is wrapped up in this uh, quote where he's saying that it should uh, be lighthearted and brilliant. In fact, he considered, instead of calling it a piano concerto, calling it a divertissement. Um, you know, something to divert and please and entertain, the very kind of a light uh, title. He doesn't end up calling that. He calls it the Piano Concerto in G. But his first movement uh, starts very much sounding like jazz. It sounds like it could be Copland or Gershwin. taken a note from his trip to the US and hearing composers like that. Um, the second movement, so it's a three movement concerto, typical of concertos, he uh, goes through this kind of beautiful simplicity is the goal here, and he actually takes a Mozart tune, a Mozart theme um, from a 
a Mozart symphony and uses that for his melody. Some nice trading off the themes and different instruments there. Just beautiful, simple stuff. Um, you know, beautiful because of its simplicity. The third movement um, starts off, and he's got lots of things going on at once. It's supposed to be this kind of sound like a, this noisy. We're back to the party, like the first movement. Noisy street fair opening up. So we actually even have different themes going on, different keys, which sounds like it should be ugly, but it's just kind of this happy cacophony, and then it comes back together. But... Um, Listen for kind of all those things, all the mess, the happy mess. So it's one of those, it's interesting, where uh, I teach a music theory class here at the college too, and we're in, uh, to this point in history, studying music of composers like Ravel and Debussy and how they're, they're leaving the old tonal system behind. Sometimes you can't really analyze it using the chords that we used to. Um, and the textbook makes the point that uh, you can't do like you can with a Mozart symphony where you can just play it on the piano and you can tell what's going on. You really kind of need to hear the fact that this is happening in this instrument. Uh, and this is happening in the piano, and this is happening in this instrument, because if you play them all together, it just sounds like a mess. But it's that things going on that are different at the same time that you have to hear those different colors for. And Ravel certainly makes good use of the orchestra, the colors of you know, this going over here, and then the flute flying over here, and the clarinet sound coming out over there. So lots of different colors and things. But that's it for Ravel. Before we go on to Strauss, any questions on Ravel? Yes. Mm -hmm. from, the, oh, from the rodeo. Mm -hmm. When we were, um, hold on, rodeo. <laughs> when we were listening to the other one where the, um, sound like the piccolo was being the bird and that, I thought, it sounds like Copeland back in that. Even. 
I'm not sure when, when Copeland wrote the Rodeo. I mean, Copeland would have been writing at the same time period. Because so this is 1928, 1930 when he was writing this. And Copeland was certainly active at this point uh, and writing. And it could very well be already done. I should know that off the top of my head, but I don't. But I would guess that, that it around the same time. Whether it had, one had an influence on the other, I can't really say. I'm not sure. But it certainly has the same, a similar sound to Copeland, doesn't it? You hear that, that American influence. I've just had this grand old time in America. The United States of America, and let's write some of that into this piano concerto. It's good fun. So I'll have to look that up for you for next time I see you. All right, on to our third piece by Richard Strauss. It looks like Richard, it's Richard, because he's German. So born in Munich, son of a fantastic horn player, um, talented young man, starts composing when he's six years old, another little Mozart. I don't know what they feed the people over there in those German-speaking countries, but feed the kids, but anyway. So his father, again, is a professional uh, horn player and manages to pull together from his friends in, in the orchestras a little chamber orchestra to play so that he can uh, have his son play in it too. So little Richard is playing violin along with, so it'd be like if you, know, you had your eight-year-old and, and you played in the Seattle Symphony and you get your, or the Northwest Symphonietta and you pull a few members of the Northwest Symphonietta to have a little fun playing in your home and, and your eight-year-old is playing next to our concert master and, and, and you know, other people from the Sinfonietta. Um, so that sort of thing. Interestingly enough, uh, Wagner's father, I mean, uh, Strauss's father, absolutely hated Wagner. He had to play a Wagner. He played it well because he was a professional, but Richard was not allowed to listen to Wagner. <laughs> no Wagner. None of this stuff. Um, and he wasn't alone. There were certainly other people who didn't like Wagner either. This is a cartoon from the time that I love. It's Wagner standing in an ear with a note that he's using as a chisel, and he's hammering that note right into the eardrum, <laughs> splitting the, the eardrum. Um, so young Strauss was to study the classics. He was to study Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven, and this is what he was supposed to listen to and study. He did listen and study a little Wagner, just had to do it under the table, you know, make sure dad didn't know about it. So uh, his career, um, when he's 19 years old, he takes a trip to Berlin and meets the conductor Hans von Bülow, uh, who says of Strauss that this is by far the most striking personality since Brahms, which is interesting because Brahms was similar in that Brahms also studied the music of earlier composers and had that kind of classical foundation. So this conductor seemed to appreciate that in both of those composers. So once he's into his 20s, he, he really gets launched. He's writing the tone poems that are performed still regularly, and everybody's loving it. And then, um, kind of in his 30s, he really hits opera and starts writing opera quite a bit. And he's working with a librettist by the name of Hugo von Hoffmannsthal, and that's the two of them together. So Wagner's the one, sorry, I keep calling him Wagner. His father would be so mad at me. <laughs> Strauss is the one without the hat, his librettist. The writer is the one with the hat. They're toying around with this idea of doing this play-opera combo uh, that Hoffmannsthal in particular is, is really wanting to do. Um, so the first half of the show would be just a spoken play. There would be some music for scenes and stuff like that, but nothing sung. The second half would then be the opera. So the first half is based on the Molière play that is the title of the piece. Again, I'm not going to attempt the uh, French, but you can see it up there, so I'll let you give it a shot. The second half was uh, the opera, um, Ariadne of Noxos. Uh, and so those are kind of the two parts of it. So in the first half, again, there was music. There was music for a dance, a ball that happened as part of the play. And there was also you know, a kind of a linking scene that happened from the play to the opera where we would have some music. Um, the premiere in 1912 was a flop, did not go well. This is what Strauss had to say. He says, the play going public had no wish to listen to opera and vice versa. <laughs> so you came for one half or the other and you didn't really want to hear the other half. Um, he says, the proper cultural soil for this pretty hybrid was lacking. It didn't help that Whoever was flipping the bill for it also had a bunch of stuff they wanted to say in the intermission. In other words, there was kind of some promotional meeting business sort of stuff that made the intermission drag out. So by the time you had the first half, a very long intermission, second half, people were ready to be, they were ready to be done, you know. You, you know, my, my 
professors when teaching me for programming a concert when I conduct things at the college would say, I said, it's better to leave people wanting more than having had enough. <laughs> and that didn't happen here. <laughs> they ended up having had enough. So Hoffmannsthal uh, agrees, fine, we'll drop the play part and we'll just focus on the opera. And so they do that. Uh, and that eventually turns into the, the opera that is still performed today. In fact, Seattle Opera did it, I think, a year or two ago, Ariadne of Noxos. So you know, it was done around here recently. Uh, so during this time, 1915 to 1922, he's really focusing on opera Strauss's and does a lot of his operas um, that, again, are still frequently performed. And he's not writing much in the way of disorchestral work. This piece that we're going to listen to is uh, one of those few exceptions, one of the few things he did during that time. And it's a concert suite from the play, not the opera, the play part. Remember there was music in the play, the dance and the transition scene? He just, Strauss just didn't want to let that music disappear and go since that, that part was a flop. So he pulls out and makes a concert suite from the music in that play. And that's why it has that title from the play rather than the opera, because it's the music from that part. So we'll, we'll just say the translation since my French is bad. The Common Gentleman. So this ends up, this little concert suite from The Common Gentleman ends up being one of his own personal favorites, or so it seems. For example, when he was, had his 75th birthday celebration, um, there was a concert, and he was asked to conduct, and he could pick whatever he wanted, and this is what he wanted to conduct, was this piece. Uh, they have another big celebration when he turns 85, and he does the same thing. <laughs> what, do you want to, what do you want to conduct now that you're 85, let's have a big party? Same piece. He dies shortly after that. So this is one of those, I'm thinking this is probably the 75 one, but when you make him out there standing in the middle, you can see how packed the house was. He was you know, well-loved, and uh, this was uh, the piece that he wanted to play. So it has this you know, beautiful, lush language that we hear in his tone poems and his operas, but yet it's a little bit more delicate setting. In other words, we're hearing it, uh, you know, not this weekend, but next in the Northwest Sinfonietta in the chamber orchestra as opposed to most of Strauss's work is you know, big, massive orchestras for these tone poems. So he has that lush quality that he writes for those big, massive orchestras, but he manages to do it in this smaller setting uh, for the chamber orchestra. Part of the result is these very Mozartian clear melodies that he writes. Um, a, an expert named Michael Kennedy on Strauss says, indubitably, this is the best of Strauss the connoisseur. You know, when Strauss wanted to pick what he wanted, this is what it was, because this was him at his finest, when it wasn't to please the audience, but it was to please him. Actually, let's go back, because I think we're going to talk about the different parts of it here. So I get, don't get ahead of myself. So um, he, the music that happens, even though it's the concert suite, you know, pulls things from the dance and other stuff like that, it still eludes the characters in the play, and there's different movements, and some of that refers to those different characters. So there's an overture, which sets it up. Basically, the story is there's this new homeowner. This is the common gentleman, right? This new homeowner. Uh, and so that's one movement. Next movement is a minuet, but it's not just a minuet. There's a, he's, this new gentleman has now, you know, he's, he's become a gentleman. He needs to learn all the finer things in life. So he hires a dance master to teach him a minuet. Try to teach a minuet. He doesn't do so well. <laughs> so he's doing his best. Uh, and the next, we have a fencing master. He's got to learn how to fence, too. And so there's some brass and piano that you'll hear that are kind of portraying that attempt at the swarthy sword fighting sort of thing. Um, entrance and dance of the tailors. At this point, we kind of hear the solo violin, and he uses also a, an old Renaissance dance, just like we had the pavan for the, for the Sleeping Beauty in Ravel. This gavotte is also an old dance like that that he draws on and uses. It's a little quicker one, though, um, a little bit. Then the minuet of 
Lully, Lully being a French Baroque composer that he pulls from a little bit. A courant, which is another old Baroque dance. Um, uh, entry of Cleante, where he borrows a melody from Lully, the composer we just mentioned a couple of movements ago. An intermezzo, and then my favorite is the dinner, in which he describes several courses of a dinner, musically. Now, Strauss is famous for uh, saying that he could portray anything in music. He was that good. <laughs> in fact, there was reportedly, I don't know how accurate this is, but there's tales of him being at a dinner with somebody, and he's claiming this, and somebody's asking about it, and he's saying, I could portray this fork in music. <laughs> and so maybe this is him proving his point. I don't know. But anyway, for the, uh, for the fish course, he quotes from Wagner's Ring, of course. He quotes from the, uh, the first one that start, you know, the first opera of Wagner's Ring Cycle starts out in the River Rhine. So he's going to take some music from the Rhine, <laughs> the river music, and use that for the fish course of the meal. And then he's going to quote some of his own music from Don Quixote, so he writes a tone poem, Don Quixote, and of course, Don Quixote is out there with the, the sheep, a shepherd right, as he's on his way out to fight the windmill or whatever. So he uses that for the lamb. Uh, and then he quotes uh, his own opera, De Rosenkavalier, for the birds. Uh, and then finally, the end of the story is that a kitchen boy hops out and leads the company in a merry waltz. And we get a waltz, and then we're done. So let's go back and see if we can maybe hear a few of those little sections. I might be able to find them as we pop around. but. Uh, so we've heard a little bit of the overture. you listen to the rest of the concert or on your own, but you get the idea. Lots of fun little, you know, different colors and different sounds, uh, and you'll listen for those as each movement kind of begins. We have a different set of instruments kind of portraying things and lots of fun. So that is our Strauss. Questions? Neil's not here for me to beg any of the questions off onto him, so I'm glad you don't have too many. <laughs> Thank you for joining the music. My email is up there if you do have other questions that you want to send to me later. And thank you for coming. Enjoy the concert. <laughs> 